people in the room and, and in the, the internet. Um, I'm happy to, to be introducing today's speaker, but I wanted to start with a land acknowledgement. Uh, the archaeological research facility is located in Huchun, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Chochenyo speaking Ohlone people, successors of the historic and sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. We acknowledge that this land remains of great importance to the Ohlone people and that the ARF community inherits a history of archaeological scholarship that has disturbed Ohlone ancestors and erased a living Ohlone people from the present and future of this land. It is therefore our collective responsibility to critically transform our archaeological inheritance in support of Ohlone sovereignty and to hold the University of California accountable for the needs of all American Indians and Indigenous peoples. With that, uh, my name is Glory Wilkie and I am honored today to be introducing our speaker, the soon-to-be Dr. Jari Hamilton. Ms. Hamilton. <laughs> Ms. Hamilton entered our program in the fall of 2015 after completing her undergraduate degree at Appalachian State. Her multi-sided research project that she'll talk about today has been funded by a UC Professional Development Award, uh, the Black Studies Collaborative Small Grants, the Center for Race and Gender Graduate Studies, and Louie Olson. She's participated in workshops on Black archival practices um, run through the Smithsonian. She's worked with um, story-based strategy training, and she's been a participant in Vennergren's um, Public Scholar Program as a Society for Black Archaeology and Sapiens Public Scholar Fellow. Ms. Hamilton's work is part of the cutting edge of publicly engaged archaeology. She is a contributor to building a archaeological future that is anti-racist and sustainable. So please join me in welcoming soon to be Dr. Jari Hamilton and her talk, Sewing, Planting, and Teaching Our Way into the Future, the Past 114 Years of, at Allensworth, California. Thank you, Jari. Thank you. I'm going to take this off while I'm up here just so you guys can hear me better. Thank you for that introduction, Lori. Okay. Within the field of anthropology and across our various interdisciplinary studies of history, cultural resource management, and historic preservation, many timely questions are asked in regards to Black cultural heritage and heritage sites. I think at the heart of these overlapping conflicts, controversies, questions, and potential answers, uh, there's one thing that's always been coming to mind. How do we make Black lives whole or full? How do we do justice and be attentive to Black lives at these sites? From the opposition, this question, very frustratingly, might quickly and carelessly be followed up with the question, why, or why should I care? Why is it important to frame Black lives as whole or full? Why in a time of Black Lives Matter? Why in a time of Black deaths by police and civilian hands in broad daylight? Why in any time? It is this question of how to make Black lives whole that my dissertation is centered around as is today's talk. I'll give a quick overview on the history of Freedom Towns in my dissertation site of Allensworth, California, along with the Colonel Allensworth State Historic Park as it stands today. The remainder of my talk will focus on my community engaged efforts with two nonprofits that are tied deeply to the park. Um, and then we'll sort of wrap up and hopefully in some of the questions that we have, I can go into more personal details about how community engagement actually went. As I continue to delve more and more into the intricacies of the formation and lived experience of black settlements, enclaves, unincorporated communities and towns across the US, one thing is clear, the people's tie to the land is imperative. It makes for an intersectional approach to talk about land, natural and cultural resources, placemaking, history, and identity. Freedman's town, free dumb towns, and race colonies all refer to the same thing, intentionally planned settlements comprised of communities of all Black residents. As a physical embodiment of social processes and agentive practice, many of these towns existed pre-Civil War, but vastly began to emerge upon an emancipated American landscape. The majority of these settlements occupied the Midwestern Plains in the Southern United States. This is important to note because if African-Americans were able to 
uh, easily and accessibly uh, get access to land, along with an obtaining an education, then they surely pose an insurmountable threat to the white man who now faced the chance of standing face to face with a man formerly enslaved, now his presumed equal. Similar to my stated mission to create a portrait of black life full, one of the overarching goals of black towns was a vehicle to gain full citizenship. As part of the first, if not the same generation to experience government sanctioned freedom, being seen and treated as second class citizens was not a status that the African American community wanted to maintain. Land acquisition was at the top of priorities um, as folks were coming out of uh, slavery. As the victims of government enforced racialized settlement patterns without the promise of federal land, around this time of 1860, uh, Blacks are finding it increasingly difficult to afford large quantities of land that are fit for an entire community while also escaping the racial terror, discrimination, and Jim Crow that's prevalent throughout the South. As Black settlements were growing in numbers between then and the 1920s, separate but in alignment to this phenomenon, African American farmers are also on the rise. African Americans are able to acquire track after track of land across the country with farmland management nearing 15 million acres across the US by 1920. Given this, it should be noted that most of the land procured by these black settlements were characteristically individual private holdings, federal lands, or railroad holdings. And while black farmers comprised of almost 14% of all farmers in the US, most of this land that they inhabited was not truly theirs, as many of these farmers simply attained property that was available through the crop lien or sharecropping systems set in place for this exact reason. Meanwhile, on the other side of the country, in California, a retired, a retired Lieutenant Colonel Allen Allensworth has planned to create California's first and only town to be founded by and for all Blacks. Born into enslavement in Kentucky in 1842, Allensworth, after learning how to read and write, escaped enslavement. After eventually joining the army, Allensworth's leadership and teaching positions gained him an increasing interest in politics. This led him to be appointed chaplain of the 24th Infantry Regiment. And upon his retirement, he and other members of a newly founded California Colony and Home Promoting Association were unsuccessful in finding affordable land for Blacks in Los Angeles. By way of some very shifty white land promoters, they were able to require very cheap tracts of land in the Southern Joaquin Valley for almost under $2 an acre. Word quickly spread by way of the Black newspapers about a mono Black town in California. Within the first five years of its founding in 1808, the population grew to nearly 800, sorry, 300 individuals. These people traveled from Oakland, Sacramento, Los Angeles, Fresno, and from outside of California to move to this town. At its height, Allensworth was a bustling place. They immediately acquired necessities like a church, a school, a post office, and a railroad stop. Residents enjoyed having lively porch debates, choir and band practice, sewing circles, hotel dinner parties, and participated in the civil rights movement, as well as subsistence farming and uh, small scale gardening. Um, I have a map of the park up here on the slide, but it's very representative of how the park, um, sorry, how the site was uh, situated. Um, I actually haven't found a complete map of the site um, as it looked in, um, 1908. Ah, okay. It's noted in the literature that each resident was also a number of various activities and associations, which I think are very important for thinking about kinship relationships. Political leanings, kinship, local geography, and social activities all aligned people into different areas. Now, as much success as the town had, things from here started going downhill pretty quickly. I wanted to include some photos that my Europe's had found of um, Allensworth in the 1970s. This is at the time that it's being created into a state historic park. These actually aligned with photos that I had taken in um, 2018, 
um, and sort of reflect the differences in those past 50 years. In 1916, Colonel Allendorf was struck by a, by actually two people on a motorcycle, um, classified as a accident. Uh, neither men were charged with anything and Colonel Allensworth's death left a huge hole in the community. Uh, at this point, um, things are continuing to go downhill as <clears throat> the town's water source is quickly depleting the local lake, which was actually uh, the largest uh, freshwater lake on the west side of the country, um, is also drying up due to damming and divestment of creeks and rivers that lead into the lake. Um, the soil is not that great for sort of cultivating anything underground, so residents are having to stick to growing um, crops that primarily do well above ground. I also wanted to include um, this article from 2019, as well as this newspaper clipping from 1972 to show that over the past hundred years, the situation with the water hasn't changed literally at all. The Pacific Farming Company, which was supposed to be the one in charge of sort of doling out um, a proper and sufficient water system for the park um, in 1908, never really fulfilled their promise, um, and the town was sort of relied, uh, was relying on groundwater for most of its time. So along with this, again, we have the county reports that are revealing that the groundwater also has high amounts of calcium, sodium, and fluoride, and was particularly arsenic and highly acidic, meaning that it also wasn't great for drinking. The last major blow that I wanted to mention um, was that this town here of Alpa wasn't really feeling Allensworth's presence in this community. It wasn't thinking that the town was something that we wanted to have around um, and therefore went through a number of underhanded ways to try to upheave the um, prosperity of the town. Uh, one of the major ways was in which they created enough money to get a spur line put through so that all of the sort of commerce would come through them rather than stopping at Allensworth. Um, this meant the, eventually the stop at Allensworth was completely removed, thus removing their access to any sort of transportation or availability to have um, anything like supplies and resources brought into the town. As an agriculturally based town, the residents' agricultural efforts were not only a way to earn income, but a means to garner intergenerational wealth, establish food security, and put forth their own ecological knowledge, while revising their own historical and cultural connections to the land that they were no longer enslaved upon. We see evidence of this archaeology as past excavations reveal much about food consumption, hunting and butchery practices, animal husbandry, farm and gardening, and food preservation needs. By this time in the 1930s, Allenworth has become a place that is really only used for temporary living during the harvesting and planting seasons. Over time, more and more families left and the town was just sort of left to its own demise. It was only due to the actions of concerned local community members in the 1970s that the site was added to the US National Register of Historic Places and eventually becoming a state historic park in 1973. I wanted to include some photos of what life was looking like in the 1970s. Um, as you can see, a lot of the buildings sort of have this very old sort of put together and look sort of made up of uh, recycled materials. Um, but there's still a very prominent community of mostly black residents living in the nearby areas. that are still very invested in the history and significance of Allensworth. I understand and consider the archaeological repository in the same way I see the archives to be used as a resource and tool to preserve, privilege, and praise the lives, histories, and voices of intentionally marginalized communities and underrepresented communities, and therefore this community's partners' projects as well. 
Traditionally, these archival institutes, uh, the products that they produce, the communities they serve, were never meant to accurately or positively reflect or represent mm -hmm. communities of color. This leads me to the current park population and their attempts at navigating the history and life of the site of local and descendant communities. So this project's two community partners are the Friends of Allensworth and the Allensworth Progressive Association. The Friends of Allensworth is a 501c3 nonprofit that seeks to support, promote, and advance the educational and interpretive activities of the state park. While the Allensworth Progressive Association was an association that was actually set up by the founders, uh, by the town's founders in the early 1900s and was continued today as a nonprofit and serves the historical and present day community situated around Allensburg. These nonprofits have provided the tools, networking and access necessary for me to conduct my own applied anthropological research with research questions intersecting with my own. My first visit to the park was in fall of 2018, admittedly a bit late in my dissertation career as I was trying to figure out what sort of route I wanted to go with my project. Once I had finally settled on what I wanted to do, my first agenda item was to go and visit the park. I arrived a day early um, before the big annual rededication ceremony in the fall. I was told by others who had visited the park before that it's really a kind of choose your own adventure style park there aren't um, Dawson's on hand or park rangers readily available um, throughout the day in which you can talk to or have them guide you through the place. Again, as you can kind of see in these two photos, um, the buildings are fairly spread apart, but everything is sort of encompasses a three mile radius, um, which is easily walkable. Um, again, there are no Dawson's or interpretive rangers stationed at any of these areas. And all of these buildings throughout the park stay locked on a daily basis, so you can't actually enter any of them. But we we're able to peer through the windows, which is what I did on my first visit, and was able to capture these sort of images, which I think give a great idea, in sort of a still life kind of way of what life might have looked like. As I walked around the restored town, um, again, I was able to peer into some of the buildings and the train that no longer stops at Allensworth is very much still present as it comes right past the town. The next day, however, the life of the park is very different. It's very lively um, from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. is the entire event and throughout the entire day, hundreds of people were filling this park. Um, there's a lot of fried fish and chicken that's being uh, fried across the food booths. There are several chapters of the Buffalo Soldiers Motorcycle Club that come roaring down that highway that runs right um, alongside the train tracks um, as they all come in on their motorcycles. It's a very uh, visceral thing to sort of feel their engines as they all come through. There's also the sounds uh, at the pavilion of rhythmic stomping of the local praise team, a gospel choir and park stewards are speaking passionately about saving Allensworth. Before this point, I'd only heard white voices talking about the site. That day was my first day hearing black stakeholders talk about the site and what it means to them. It was here among the rows of pop-up vendor tents and informational booths that I found friends of Allensworth in my project's direction. I wanted to show this juxtaposition because I thought it was kind of funny and also very cool um, of the very short-lived bicycle corps um, that occurred in the late 19th century um, and how someone decided to set up bikes at the rededication ceremony to sort of reflect this history. So setting up a community collaborative project can be very difficult and time intensive. Doing this work has involved my presence and participation in a number of meetings, phone calls, and local events, and doing a lot of network month to month. It has meant a lot of trial and error in the shifting of this project's focus over years. Originally, I was designing a project that would focus on Black masculinity and Black citizenship by way of the military, and I thought I'd be working at Yosemite, 
and I was also supposed to be collaborating with a local Bay Area school. But as irregular communication and access to the site proved to be too difficult and too much of a risk, I definitely had to pivot um, a great bit. In understanding and identifying who exactly connected communities were to Allensworth, I wanted to pay respect to the two distinct lives that this town had lived. One, past life as a freedom town, and a second sort of present day life as a, a state historic park. These two lives are distinct, but still connected to each other by way of their communities. It was apparent that many different intersecting groups had lived at Allensworth, as well as had their own connections to Allensworth, even if they hadn't lived at the site itself. Some connections were based on direct familial descent, but I also became aware of the fact that Allensworth also served as a destination point. Individuals or families would come to visit Allensworth during parties, or come visit family members or friends who lived in a nearby area and would say, hey, let's go to Allensworth this weekend. And therefore a larger community of involved groups grew. The park has also grown now to include a very active community of site stewards and stakeholders, like those within the nonprofit world, the local government, the descendant community, park employees, and the local and broader uh, community of African American residents who have a sense of shared responsibility for the park's well being based on cultural and historical significance. This brings me to the actionable collaborative work that community partners and I have engaged in over the past few years. My efforts have come in the form of several projects and endeavors. The Allensworth Progressive Association has recently revised their master plan, which we have been working on implementing this year. I think it is very telling that this master plan, as I've tried to show through these two um, columns in the slide here, um, their master plan is one that actively mitigates the historic and sustained contemporary effects of settler colonialism and systematic racism. The goals and future hopes for this park imagine it as a space in which engagement by the community, visitors, and youth are more frequent, fulfilling, and intersectional. In observing Friends of Allen with meetings, it is very clear that they want to bring a renewed sense of life to the park to redefine the public's understanding of its current day significance and use and not existing in a static demeanor, a demeanor, but as an active place where the community and public can routinely gather safely to learn, celebrate, and share ideas. Again, on major event days as a visitor, you're welcome to like walk through the park and sort of experience it in your own way. Um, but on major event days, all of the buildings are open and there's usually a couple of docents located in each building to tell you about the history of the specific the site area that you're in. Um, so each building is filled with replicas, which I find very interesting. Um, so in the excavations that were done in the 70s as the park is, as the site is transitioning from a site to a park, um, all of the objects were housed in Sacramento, and that's where they currently reside. Um, each of the buildings are filled with replicas of what they assume life would be like at the park. When I first visited in 2018, I asked one of the park rangers if they had any actual artifacts on display. He said, I think maybe in the visitor center, but maybe not. I'm not really sure. It's much easier just to sort of buy these things online because they're more easily accessible and display them in that way. Regardless of the politics or the realities of that situation, I'm still wondering how these artifacts that are in Sacramento can be utilized to support community needs. Um, as I walked through some of the houses, though, it was great to see the visitors interacting with the objects that were familiar to them. They sparked a memory. They were like, oh, that ceramic glass uh, plate reminds me of like my aunties, or that dress reminds me of my grandmother's. Um, so it was so great to see that folks were able to engage with these objects, regardless of, they whether, of whether they were artifacts or not. One of the major changes coming soon to the park is uh, the securing of a new visitor center. At a recent association meeting this year, I was uh, introduced to archaeologists Beatrice Cox and Eric Thompson, um, who had also worked at the site with some of the excavation uh, materials. 
as both the archaeological collections and the archives serve to bear witness to document and preserve a national cultural heritage, I'm wondering how these materials can serve as counter narrative tools in aiding to combat these contested histories and the politics of memory that I'm constantly being cautioned about through various encounters that I'm having. I suggest that if there was a way to use the new visitor center space as a new museum exhibit, this would be a great way to utilize both the archival materials that the association is collecting through an archival committee, as well as the artifacts in Sacramento to sort of give a greater experience to this, especially when on a regular basis, most of the buildings visitors don't have access to. Knowing the history of the town and the park, imagine being a visitor and not hearing the words racism, slavery, or discrimination mentioned in the narrative of this town. This is the active engagement that visitors are facing as they talk to park rangers about the interpretation of the site. The situation has been described to me many times by different community members, um, as well as a second more alarming situation in which white armed law enforcement rangers are now stationed throughout the park at each major event. This is not the way it's always been. At the last event I attended last fall, I was asked by a community member why these park um, rangers who were law enforcement, not necessarily, not necessarily interpreted rangers, were there and that this isn't the way that they had always uh, functioned on these event days. While the majority of friends of Allen's work, the descendant community itself, and the visitors that come to these events are Black, all of these sorts of authority figures the park is facing are white. The ramifications of the policing of this site, its land, its voice, and its people are growing immensely year after year, and the community is continuously having to pivot to find a solution. Mm. With much assistance from Anthro 2AC ACES students in the spring of 2017 and 2020, as well as with UREP's apprentices in the spring of 2021 through this semester, we've embarked on a number of deliverables that I believe aid in making Black Lives whole and seen at the state park. One special deliverable to me um, is the creation of an Allensworth syllabus. By creating the syllabus, I wanted something that not only reflected and situated the relevancy of the park in Freedom Towns within a larger context of not only Black history, but American history, I was hoping that this would also function as a living resource for the community and the park staff. The syllabus was not directly asked of me by the community, which is something that I actually engaged in in 2017 um, of my own uh, sort of volition. Um, but I was inspired by the Beyonce Lemonade album syllabus, um, which brings together a number of topics relating to Black womanist theory, uh, music, sort of other sorts of media that can all be talked about, used to talk about these things. Uh, it was after this point that I learned about the 2015 Charleston syllabus that was co-created by Dr. Chad Williams and other Charleston historians in response to the shooting of nine parishioners at Emmanuel African Methodist Church. This was followed by the 2020 Tulsa syllabus created by Dr. Alicia Odawale and other Tulsa-based scholars in memorial of the Tulsa Race Massacre and recent police violence against primarily Black men. Over time, the syllabus has been added to by my UREPs and ACES students, and it has grown to become quite a resource. I brought this resource to the table once I felt like it gained a good bit of information that could be utilized to the education committee of um, Allentworth State Historic Park. Uh, the Center for Understanding, which is one of the goals of the Progressive Association within the next few years, would serve as a great way to house this sort of information as they're wanting to bring in school groups and lectures um, and various youth programs to talk about Black history and Black culture as it relates to the site and broader um, cultural themes. Although Allensworth is not the only California-based freedom town, it is by no means the only Black settlement in the state. I have been recently also having conversations with other archaeologists about how to figure out um, how to best understand, analyze, and map these sites.
I actually came across the first map that I have ever seen that is mapping black settlements um, at large across California. These are not um, official black freedom towns, but more so all sorts of unincorporated black communities, townships, hollers, if you will, um, and other black settlements um, across time. Sorry. The next deliverable that I wanted to talk about arose in the aftermath of the height of COVID-19. After two years of not being able to hold the park's annual rededication ceremony, in 2021, the Educational Committee reached out and asked for assistance in creating a brochure for the event, one that would accurately reflect the history of the park and its people. With continued input and regular, uh, regular meetings with the committee in the months leading up to the ceremony, I listened and wrote the story the community wanted me to tell. Other deliverables that my Europe's and I have been engaging in over the past year also included interviews with um, descendant community members, digitizing and cataloging family photographs, town records, and research notes for the archival committee, as well as assisting with a national monument designation process and writing letters of support for park funding and public awareness. By invoking and constructing Black Life Full, it is to imagine it without limitations or restrictions, as worthy of experiencing the same joy as everyone else. There's a way to honor the ancestors and center memory and commemoration directly upon the landscape. Community informed narratives do not disregard difficult histories or shy away from trauma, but at the same time, they're not completely trauma centered. There's joy to be shared as well. In doing all of this, it encourages and allows for the continuation of Black land stewardship. Amplifying these sites as a vital um, part of American history and its legacy also aids in the sustaining of the Black communities tied to these sites and thus the land the sites occupy. It validates the African-American experience. I had a lot of anxiety initially in setting up a community-engaged research agenda with these nonprofits but I was immediately and continuously greeted with warm smiles, hearty laughs, a spilling of the tea, if you will, and a welcome prayer with each interaction I had with different community members. And this was whether it was in person, by Zoom, or phone call. With each conversation, the words, we're glad to have you here, were spoken to me. I realized I didn't speak about archaeology at the site, but I assure you, it is in my dissertation. Mm -hmm. uh, but as this is my final brown bag, <clears throat> Before graduation, I only felt it right to dedicate the entirety of this talk to the work that we have done together, just as, the, just as they have invested their light and encouragement in me. As the communities invested in Allentworth continue to work towards revitalization and relevancy, I plan on continuing to promote an archaeology rooted in community healing and listening as Allentworth continues to be a place of home for me. Thank you. All right, we have about 15 minutes. I thought the rest of this time could be used to either ask questions or have conversations um, with more detail about how the engagement worked or how the research process went. Um, let's see, how do I see everyone? They have questions on Zoom. Yeah. Okay. Um, You're welcome to unmute, I guess. Mm -hmm. It looks like if you click on that. Ah, uh, yeah. See. Okay. You're welcome to pop a question in chat, in chat, or folks in person have questions. <laughs> yes, Christine. Thank you. First of all, I'm thrilled to be in this room with other people. It's so <laughs> nice. Um, but that was great. I knew you were working at that site, uh, but I didn't know the details. So thank you very much. Um, I have two, one. I think you alluded to right at the end, and so maybe we can elucidate. But before you do that, let me ask my first question first, which is: you showed us pictures of the reconstruction. Yes. Uh, we know that. 
And and I know you're going to try and work on getting the real objects back that you can disperse it. Um, and you showed us sort of houses. Yeah. You know, in the distance, what I want to know is what did, what have, has anybody found and what did you see of houses that are gone? Meaning, if there was mm -hmm. to dig in archaeology, there's often you know not house there, and you're digging right. in the foundations or the winds or the backyard or something. Tell us something about that. If that if, that, if any of that has happened. Yeah, and that leads to my second question, which is, where do you see this great sort of basic? You know, you've now got your sort of knowledge on it. Mm -hmm. what, where do you see sort of the two most important things that you're going to move forward with this community and this and this place of in the near future after you're done with your dissertation? Yeah, big questions. <laughs> um, for your first question, um, I can talk about some of the excavations. Um, so. In the early 1970s, uh, California State Parks um, Service, their Parks and Recreation Department, um, did a number of excavations, I think over the course of uh, about three years. Um, a number of the homes uh, had excavations done, as well as a lot of the institutions like the church and the school. Um, they found a lot of foundations of buildings and a lot of scrap material that were just sort of remnants of what was left of the buildings. So scattered around the outside of the building? Yeah, um, I don't have any photos on me at hand, um, or else I could show you some images of that. Um, one thing I'm not sure of is if those buildings were demolished in remodeling them, or if they were actually just reconstructed based on what was remaining of the actual standing buildings. Now that's what I'm mm -hmm. curious about. Were those reconstructed in the right. same place, or were they old buildings that mm -hmm. were still there? And were there other buildings that were really just kind of you walk across and just sort of piece them up? Right. I have heard that some of the buildings are not in their original location, uh -huh. like I think the hotel. Right. Um, so I think some of them are completely remodeled and have shifted slightly. So there's still a lot of kind of real dirt up there. There is, there definitely is. Um when I've been talking to community members, they'll like pick something up and show it to me. And it's like a piece of ceramic that's definitely not one of, you know, the, um, something that was bought online. Um, yeah. And then I think for your second question, I definitely see myself again, as I said, continuing the work that I've been doing um, with the nonprofits. I think next steps would probably be to get a job. <laughs> um, getting paid for this work would be great. Um, but I definitely see areas for improvement within the interpretation of the park. And I think that's where my skills would best be utilized. Um, there is no state parks archaeologist um, at Allensworth. Um, so most of um, the guys who came in again were with state parks and were sort of contracted in and there hasn't been any archaeology done besides that. Um, and I know the last time that I did speak with park rangers, they were interested in having some other sorts of survey work done. Um, there has been some um, CRM done of the uh, cemetery uh, that exists, as it's one that a lot of the tombstones are missing, and they're not exactly sure who's interred there. Um, so um, one of the archaeologists, Erica Thompson, had done some magnetometry surveys and some other um, types of surveys um, to sort of get an idea of how many burials are actually there, um, being that unfortunately a lot of the headstones have been stolen or removed as they've gone through a number of different hands of um, ownership. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, Lucy. First of all, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. That was a great talk. Um, I was wondering whether you could speak a little bit of either more generally or specifically about um, the sort of placemaking and uh, stewardship that you were talking about. Like, I was particularly interested in mentioning the freshwater lake that mm -hmm. had dried up. Um, you know, have you in your interviews or re archival research or archaeological research? Um, found evidence of placemaking specifically related to the lake or mm -hmm. some other. Yeah, I haven't. Um, I haven't done much digging about the lake. 
Um, but I have been told that it did have a, a very large indigenous presence and a connection to that. And that was something that the park was wanting to engage in connecting those histories together um, in terms of how folks were utilizing the lake. Because again, it's a huge lake um, that you know went from almost at the edge of the East Bay all the way through the Central Valley. Um, so it would be interesting to do a history on the lake and its use. Um, but no, I personally haven't heard any um, personal stories um, from community members about um, their sort of place making in relation to the lake. Um, one of the many projects that I did last semester with my Europe's um, was I did create a Foodways e-cookbook um, in which I sort of um, went over the history in relation to animal husbandry and gardening and farming um, and all these other sort of uh, things at the park based on uh, faunal remains and some of the artifacts related to the hotel and some of the ceramics that were found in the houses um, as a way to sort of go about talking about those things. Um, and I'd love to do that in sort of a larger view of the entire park. Yeah, it'd be cool to look at like the faunal remains that are lake fish. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. I've been trying to find a menu for the hotel and have yet to find Ooh. one. Junko. <laughs> Thank you for the great talk. Um, I'm going to ask you to watch Lucy. Okay. Just ask. Um, do you have some sense of um, agricultural practice? You know, mm -hmm. what kind of crops were um, produced for you know, how much and mm -hmm. uh, um, some kind of a sense? And I think that is because um, when you think of the Native American um, tribes' history and uh, their practice and uh, people's movement and uh, also um, immigrants coming from overseas, um, a lot of things are going on right. in that area. And I think um, to place, on the one hand, to look at the place making at the micro scale, but also to think about the larger spatial and temporal scale and think about multiple stakeholders in the area. Sure. And when you do that, I think what they were growing and uh, um, how that was distributed. And mm -hmm. that, that kind of thing can potentially be helpful to understand, but also to think about the future. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, Um. something that I didn't show in today's talk, but I do have my dissertation, are a number of um, newspaper articles that are promoting the town. Um, encouraging people to come and they're talking about again how viable the land is and different residents are giving promotions about what they are growing. Um, so there has been records of growing alfalfa, barley, wheat, cotton, um, as well as uh, I know in some of the, the individual home gardens, um, families were also growing melons, different types of melons, potatoes and sweet potatoes, uh, different berries, including grapes, um, oranges. I saw that they had a number of um, orchard trees, which I haven't seen pictures of, um, but there is uh, a quote in a book in which someone is mentioning um, picking uh, grapes and oranges and apples. Um, something else that I was also looking into um, was that a number of the women were also being hired to work on other farms in the area. Um, and seeing sort of the juxtaposition of those two things I think would also be interesting. Um, a number of the women are being hired at a, a new cannery that was opened in Visalia at that time. Um, and so a lot of the women are talking about in some of the records that they are um, selling the milk from the cows that they have at Allensworth to these um, canneries for distribution um, as a way for income, um, as well as uh, cream and cheese. Yeah, Lori? Just following up on the cannery is interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, Sally following her work at Isleton found in oral histories that um, family members who worked in the canneries often had access to the things that weren't in hand. Mm -hmm. So they would bring home the, the tips of things that were not processed and, and a lot of other surplus foodstuffs that were seen as you know, not 
not the edible parts, but the absolute work. Mm -hmm. There's a whole range of, of recipes yeah. that circulate in the, in the community that are from these left off pivots, you know, like mm -hmm. the, the, the leafy parts of broccoli and things. So mm -hmm. it might be interesting asking community members when you, when you do more oral histories For sure. how that may have. Some of the previous ones that I've been able to listen to, which are on a tape recorder, yeah. um, uh, some of the descendants are talking about, um, there's a large duck population there, and so the men would do duck drives when the season came around. Um, so duck was something that they enjoyed a lot, um, as well as I still see rabbits there a lot, and rabbits are mentioned a lot, as well as like guinea fowl um, and uh, rabbit burgers were being mentioned by being made by the Hackett family. Um, and they would sell those um, to the local community at lunchtime as folks are coming in from the fields. Yeah. Yes. Well, thank you for the work that you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've heard some really interesting stories about the families who lived there as the town was made unsustainable and they were forced you know, to live in other places. Um, did they all, did they move to like nearby towns or like Oakland and the East Bay? How did they kind of maintain that network that you were then able to yeah. connect with? Um, as some of my undergrad students and I have been trying to sort of track down, down those family records and family histories, which has been rather hard, um, we are noticing that there's a trend of folks who are going to sort of more bigger urban black areas, Los Angeles, Oakland, and San Francisco um, are the major ones. Um, in some of the descendants I've talked to, um, they mentioned that their grandparents who had lived there had ended up moving back to Fresno. Some of them had moved to um, Los Angeles, um, as well as some of them moved out of state completely. Um, the descendant community member that, I, uh, that we interviewed Miss Sarah, um, after moving out of Allensworth, her great grandmother had moved to a nearby rural town for like a year, and then they moved to Ohio. Um, that's where they stayed, and that's where they had continued to live um, into her current generation. Hmm. Maybe? Um, I think a little similar line, mm -hmm. but the beginning um, of the town, you mentioned that people move from like, outside of the state as well as from the state. Do you have a sense of like, where else where? in the US they were coming from? Yeah, some of the, the records at least that we've been able to find um, by way of some of the fold three records that Lori's been helping me go through. Um, I've noticed Kansas popping up some. Uh, Virginia and the Carolinas are pretty prevalent and a couple of Midwestern states. Um, but those are about the only ones I've really seen so far. Mostly a lot of folks are coming out of California from other parts of California. Yes. I just want to say that watching you develop this project over the years has really come uh, into a beautiful position. So thank you so much, Sarah. Yeah, thank you. I will say that uh, the class that I took with um, you my first semester definitely inspired, I think, my early beginnings of figuring out of what I wanted to do and how to involve um, digital heritage and talking about family histories and talking about local histories and um, doing that project, uh, that group project was uh, a wonderful way to introduce my time here at Berkeley. Thank you. I don't think we have any questions over Zoom. I think everyone's about done here. And it's exactly one o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you.